the top of the hour, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's GlomCon seminar series. Today, our talk is titled C3 Glomerulopathy from Pathways to Therapies, and we're excited to welcome our speaker, Dr. Purva Sharma. All right. Um, so this is one of the most um, exciting topics these days, so uh, I thought I'd uh, sort of shed some light on it. Um, so C3 glomerulopathy, so my title is From Pathways to Therapies. Um, so the agenda for this talk is so to outline the pathophysiology, differential diagnosis, and the role of genetic studies in C3G, and evaluate the mechanisms uh, and action of investigative therapies for C3G, and now to approved therapies for C3G. I'll try to finish this talk in about, you know, 40 minutes or so, and then or 45 minutes. Um, so it will give enough time for questions at the end. <clears throat> so what is C3G? Um, it's a disease process that is characterized by alternative complement pathway dysregulation. It needs a kidney biopsy that shows that C3 is at least two orders of magnitude higher than the other components like IgG. Um, so it's important to note that it's not isolated CTG, it doesn't need to be isolated C3, it just has to be two orders of magnitude higher than the surrounding components, uh, like immunoglobulins. The other very important thing to remember in C3G is it needs to be diagnosed at least three months after an infection. So um, C3-dominant glomerulonephritis, um, which is infection-associated, can look very similar to C3G. So um, if you have a concurrent infection and if you have a history of infection and it looks like C3 dominant, there's no way to distinguish the two on, on the basis of a kidney biopsy. And then it can be dense deposit disease or C3 glomerulonephritis. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, how to distinguish between the two. So just to start off, uh, CT glomerulopathy, it's not a new disease. Um, it seems like we've been talking a lot about it in the last four or five years, in fact, in the last 10 years, but it's been, it's been going on for a very long time. Part of the problem with C3G used to be that it used to be called very many different names, um, you know, in, in, in its career. Um, so even in, for example, 1962, these are just a few publications um, that um, have come about in the field of C3G. So it used to be called MPGN with low C3 in the absence of systemic disease. Then there were dense deposits identified on electron microscopy in 1973. Um, there was an entity called C3 glomerulonephritis in 2007. Um, finally, in 2013, there was a new name and a consensus report. So now it's been over 10 years since actually the name C3 glomerulopathy was coined. Um, and finally, in 2017, there was an AHUS, uh, atypical HUS and C3G um, JDGO contro controversies conference that sort of uh, renamed all of these things. And it was important to sort of classify that as a new disease or um, a, a new name because so much was happening in, in, uh, in this field. <clears throat> so why the need to define a new disease, right? Uh, we've been calling it very many different names. We've been calling it MPG and type two, type one, um, and dense deposits, et cetera. So we know that the clinical course and the glomerular pathology associated with isolated C3 deposition is very heterogeneous. Um, it can present with a variety of symptoms. Um, it can present um, not just with a variety of symptoms, but also varied clinical manifestations, variety of uh, biopsy findings, et cetera. Um, our understanding of the relationship between complement system dysregulation and glomerular information has improved substantially. So the learning curve for complement mediated kidney disease in general has been very, very steep. Um, the slope has been very steep in the last few years. We've learned so much uh, more about complement than we used to um, in the past. And then, you know, a lot of therapies are coming out now, uh, and it's important to identify the kind of patients who will benefit from the new therapies of C3G. So it was important to sort of characterize this disease uh, in, in a more defined way. <clears throat> So as I said, it was it used to be classified as different types of MPGN. So historic classification was MPGN type 1, type 2, and type 3. And ultimately, we realized that, um, you know, if based on electron microscopy, um, if there were mesangial and subendothelial deposits 
and on immunofluorescence, there was C3 alone, was classified as C3GN. MPGN type 2 was, was your classic dense deposit disease and highly electron-dense mesangial and intramembranous deposits, plus, plus minus Bowman capsule deposits, with C3 alone was dense deposit disease. And MPGN type 3 was, again, uh, similar types of deposits as MPGN type 1, uh, but a little bit more varied, uh, again, with C3GN. So... C3GN along with dense deposit disease was clubbed into something called C3 glomerulopathies, right? So, um, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what the mechanisms of C3 glomerulopathy in general are, but you know, overall the big triggers of C3 are autoimmunity, infection, and monoclonal comopathy. So anytime you have uh, a diagnosis of C3 glomerulopathy, you have to make sure that you rule out all of those things. <clears throat> so this is, again, MPGN pattern on biopsy. If there's a dominant C3 staining, again, it's not isolated C3 staining, but it's a dominant C3 staining, um, it's considered to be C3 glomerulopathy. And C3 glomerulopathy, if, it's, if you have highly dense intramembranous deposits, it's dense deposit disease. If not, then C3GN. And if you don't have dominant C3 staining and if you have immunoglobulin staining, um, it's classified as immune complex MPGN and none um, is, is TMA. So, you know, overall MPGN pattern of injury has also undergone a change in the last few years. Uh, we used to, you know, do electron microscopic classification, but now we're doing IF classification of MPGN. So this was the consensus report in 2013 I was talking about earlier. Um, so if they defined C3 glomerulopathy um, to be a disease process due to abnormal control of complement activation, deposition, or degradation, and was characterized by predominant glomerulus C3 fragment deposition with electron dense deposits on electron microscopy. So um, again, the same thing, dense deposit is dense intramembranous, C3 glomerulonephritis is light amorphous, um, all types of deposits in all locations, mesangial, subendothelial, and subepithelial deposits. C3 dominant GN. 